This morning I want to talk to you about the idea of settling accounts. There are at least a couple times in Scripture that we're going to look at today where one of the quote-unquote famous Bible heroes is on their deathbed and they are talking to their sons and talking to those who will go on before them and they have some quote-unquote unfinished business to attend to. And I think that we can learn from these couple of times and so I hope that uh, as we study that these will be beneficial to you. The first person that I want to talk about this morning is Jacob. And we're going to be setting some context for the settling of the count that happens in Genesis 49. But if you would first turn over to Genesis chapter 34. Genesis chapter 34. And look with me at verse 24. Now the context of this is that Jacob and his family have settled in the city of Shechem. And the prince of the city of Shechem has defiled Dinah, Jacob's daughter. And Jacob's sons are not well pleased with this. And so they come up with this plan to have all the men of Shechem circumcised. And that is exactly what happens. In verse 24 all who went out of the gate of his city listened to Hamor and his son Shechem, and every male was circumcised, all who went out of the gate of his city. Now it came about on the third day when they were in pain that two of Jacob's sons, Simeon and Levi, Dinah's brothers, each took his sword and came upon every city, uh, came upon the city unawares and killed every male. They killed Hamor and his son Shechem with the edge of the sword, and took Dinah from Shechem's house and went forth. Jacob's sons came upon the slain and looted the city because they had defiled their sister. They took their flocks and their herds and their donkeys and that which was in the city and that which was in the field, and they captured and looted all their wealth and all their little ones and their wives, even all that was in the houses. Then Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, you have brought trouble on me by making me odious among the inhabitants of the land, among the Canaanites and the Perizzites, and my men being few in number, that they will gather together against me and attack me, and I will be destroyed, I and my household. But they said, should he treat our sister as a harlot? So Simeon and Levi take matters into their own hands, and they kill all the men of the city, not just Hamor and Shechem, but all of the men in the city, and then they plunder the city with all of their goods. And Jacob does indeed take this time to rebuke them for what they've done and, and say that he's, they've caused problems for him, but that's all he does is rebuke them at this time. And then in Genesis 35, we see his son Reuben as well. Genesis chapter 35 and verse 22. It came about while Israel was dwelling in that land that Reuben went and lay with Bilhah, his father's concubine, and Israel heard of it. Now, Reuben comes and takes his father's concubine, and, and that was uh, not moral at all. That was his father's concubine, and, and uh, a legal way of speaking, it was like taking his wife. And Reuben goes and lays with her. Israel hears of it, but that's all that we read for now about what Jacob will do to Reuben. He, all he, he hears of it, he doesn't do anything about it. Until we come to Genesis 49. Genesis chapter 49. And verse 1. Then Jacob summoned his sons and said, Assemble yourselves that I may tell you what will befall you in the days to come. 
Gather together and hear, O sons of Jacob, and listen to Israel your father. Reuben, you are my firstborn, my might and the beginning of my strength, preeminent in dignity and preeminent in power, uncontrolled as water. You shall not have preeminence, because you went up to your father's bed, then you defiled it. He went up to my couch. Simeon and Levi are brothers. Their swords are implements of violence. Let my soul not enter into their counsel. Let not my glory be united with their assembly, because in their anger they slew men, and in their self-will they lamed oxen. Cursed be their anger, for it is fierce, and their wrath, for it is cruel. I will disperse them in Jacob, and scatter them in Israel. So Jacob is near his death. And he assembles his sons together to tell them essentially what their inheritance would be. What would happen to them in the days to come. And he starts with Reuben. He starts with his firstborn. And he starts with, you know, seemingly a compliment that, yes, he is the beginning of his strength and he is preeminent in dignity and power, but he says, no, you're not going to have preeminence because you are as uncontrolled or unstable as water. He remembered what Reuben had done, that Reuben went up and defiled his father's bed and he says, no, you're not going to have preeminence in this family. And then he turns to the next youngest, or next oldest, excuse me, Simeon and Levi. And he deals with them together because together they went up and they killed the men of Shechem. And he says, my soul is not going to enter your council. My glory is not going to be united with their assembly because in their anger they slew men. In their self-will they laid oxen cursed be their anger, for it is fierce, and the wrath for it is cruel. This act of cruelty, this act of malice, where they are, are taking it upon themselves to enact vengeance for what has happened to Dinah, they were cursed for it. And they were dispersed and scattered in Jacob. When we look at what happens in the history of Israel, this is exactly the case. It was not Reuben who was the ruling tribe of Israel, nor was it Simeon and Levi, but in the verses to come, Jacob picks Judah. Judah is the one who will be the ruler of the tribes of Israel. And what happens to Simeon and Levi? Simeon's territory ends up being inside of Judah's territory. They are dispersed in Israel. They are scattered in Israel. And how about Levi? Levi doesn't even have territory, but rather they have cities interspersed throughout Israel. And so Jacob deals with these three sons who were wicked, who had displeased their father as he is coming upon his death. Now for time's sake, we won't read the rest of this chapter, but he doesn't just deal with the sons that were wicked, but he also deals with these other sons as well. Specifically, he blesses most of all Judah and Joseph. But he blesses his other sons as well. The next person I want to turn to is David. David, if you would turn to the book of 2 Samuel, we will be in the books of 2 Samuel and 1 Kings when we talk about David. And we want to focus in on a few people in David's life that when it comes to the time of his death, he deals with them later rather than sooner. And the first person that we want to deal with is Joab. Now, Joab is David's nephew, and for most of his life, he is 
the commander of David's army. Now we will look at one time where this is not the case. But for most of Joab's life, he is the commander of David's army. And yet, Joab is quite self-serving and doesn't really always do what David would want him to do. One such case is when he murders Abner in 2 Samuel chapter 3. Turn over there if you will. 2 Samuel chapter 3. Abner was the commander of Saul's army when Saul was alive. And Abner takes Saul's son Ishbosheth and raises him up as king. But Ishbosheth ends up falling out of the good graces of Abner. And Abner defects to David's army. But Joab doesn't like that. And in chapter 3 of 2 Samuel, verse 26, when Joab came out from David, he sent messengers after Abner, and they brought him back from the well of Sirah, but David did not know it. So when Abner returned to Hebron, Joab took him aside in the middle of the gate to speak with him privately. And there he struck him in the belly so that he died on account of the blood of Azahel, his brother. Afterward, when David heard it, he said, I and my kingdom are innocent before the Lord forever of the blood of Abner, the son of Ner. May it fall on the head of Joab and all his father's house. And may there not fail from the house of Joab one who has a discharge or one who is a leper or one who takes hold of a distaff or one who falls by the sword or who lacks bread. So Joab and Abishai, his brother, killed Abner because he had put their brother Azahel to death in the battle at Gideon. So one reason mentioned here why Joab murders Abner is because Abner had killed his brother Azahel in the battle at Gideon. Now this was more a casualty of war than outright murder, but Joab and his brother Abishai harbored ill will because of that. However, Given what we see later of Joab, which we will talk about, Abner also presents himself as a rival. Abner was a skilled warrior and was commander of Saul's army. And if Joab wasn't careful, Abner very well could have taken Joab's position. And so I think it's likely that Joab is also murdering him because he saw him as a threat to his position. But then we have a couple incidents which, for time's sake, we won't read about. But in 2 Samuel 14, Absalom, David's son, had been in exile for a while because he had murdered his brother over the defilement of his sister Tamar. And Absalom was in exile, and, and David was torn up because of this, because Absalom had... Yes, committed murder, but he did so in defense of his sister. And so David has mixed feelings about this. And it's Joab who sees David torn up about this and sets a plan in motion to bring Absalom back. Well, in chapter 15 of 2 Samuel, Absalom does come back, but then he starts to work on an insurrection and rebels and ends up sending David out of the palace for a time and conspires against him. Well, David ends up fleeing from the palace for a while, but he does eventually do battle against Absalom's army and wins. And Joab in chapter 18, though David had told him to deal kindly with Absalom and not treat him harshly, Joab finds Absalom hanging in a tree from his long hair and kills Absalom. Contrary to what David had ordered. And then in chapter 20, perhaps because David had sensed that Joab was responsible for killing Absalom, for a time, Joab is no longer the commander of David's army. That falls to a man by the name of Amasa. But there is a man named Sheba who causes a revolt and 
David's armies go out to battle to, to quell this revolt. And in chapter 20 and verse 8, when they were at the large stone which is in Gibeon, Amasa came to meet them. Now Joab was dressed in his military attire, and over it was a belt with a sword and a chief fastened at his waist. And as he went forward, it fell out. Joab said, said to Amasa, Is it well with you, my brother? And Joab took Amasa by the beard with his right hand to kiss him. But Amasa was not on guard against the sword which was in Joab's hand, so he struck him in the belly with it and poured out his inward parts on the ground, and he did not strike him again, and he died. Then Joab and Abishai, his brother, pursued Sheba, the son of Bichri. So here's another rival to Joab who has taken his job, and Joab doesn't like that, so he just goes out and murders him in broad daylight, so to speak. And the final thing that Joab does is as David is on his deathbed, and it was clear that David's will was for Solomon to be king, but Joab and others have other designs. In 1 Kings chapter 1, 1 Kings chapter 1 and verse 5, Now Adonijah the son of Haggith exalted himself, saying, I will be king. So he prepared for himself chariots and horsemen with fifty men to run before him. His father had never crossed him at any time by asking, Why have you done so? And he was also a very handsome man, and he was born after Absalom. He had conferred with Joab the son of Zeruiah and with Abiathar the priest, and following Adonijah, they helped him. So, though it was David's will for Solomon to be king, Adonijah raises himself up. And who was supporting him at this time but Joab? Now, when Joab murdered Abner, David did pronounce a curse upon him and his family for the blood of Abner. And yes, you could argue that his, his role in restoring and then murdering Absalom caused David to knock him down a peg by being commander of his army. But then he murders Amasa and, gets, and puts down the revolt and he's back to being commander. And then he supports Adonijah. We'll talk more about Joab later when we get there. But I want to bring another person out, and that is a man by the name of Shimei, or Shimei. Going back to 2 Samuel, let's go back to chapter 16. The context is that David is fleeing from Jerusalem because of Absalom's revolt, rebellion. And while he is fleeing... This man named Shimei comes, comes out and causes some problems for David. Starting in verse 5 of 2 Samuel chapter 16. When David came to Behurim, behold, there came out from there a man of the family of the house of Saul, whose name was Shimei, the son of Gera. He came out cursing continually as he came. He threw stones at David and all the servants of the King David and all the people and all the mighty men were at his right hand and at his left. Thus Shimei said when he cursed, Get out, get out, you man of bloodshed and worthless fellow. The Lord has returned upon you all the bloodshed of the house of Saul in whose place you have reigned. And the Lord has given the kingdom into the hand of your son Absalom. And behold, you are taken in your own evil, for you are a man of bloodshed. Then Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, said to the king, Why should this dead dog curse my lord the king? Let me go over now and cut off his head. But the king said, What have I to do with you, O sons of Zeruiah? If he curses, and if the Lord has told him, Curse David, then who shall say, Why have you done so? Then David said to Abishai and to all his servants, Behold, my son who came out from me seeks my life. How much more now this Benjamite? Let him alone and let him curse, for the Lord has told him. Perhaps the Lord will look on my affliction and returns good to me instead of his cursing this day. So David and his men went along the way, 
And Shimei went along the hillside parallel with him. And as he went, he cursed and cast stones and threw dust at him. So Shimei comes out and he's cursing David while David is fleeing from Absalom. Really just pouring it on. One of the worst days of David's life. Worst times of David's life. And Shimei is just adding on to it. And he's saying that David deserved this. That because of what he did to the house of Saul, that David was a man of bloodshed. Well, the problem is, is that David had never done anything violent to Saul and his household at all. He protected Saul and his household every step of the way. David had chances to kill Saul when Saul was pursuing him and David refused. And so this was not accurate by Shimei at all. And he's hurling these curses and these insults and actual stones and dust at David and his men. But even when Abishai, David's nephew, the brother of Joab, offers to go put an end to it by killing him, David says, in some translations it says, maybe the Lord has told him. My translation says the Lord has told him. It's not exactly clear whether God had actually told Shimei to do this, but David, at the very least, thinks that it's a possibility that this is the case, and he is willing to let this happen. He says, perhaps the Lord will look on my affliction and return good to me instead of his cursing this day. And so David is not looking to avenge himself against Shimei in this case but rather let him keep on cursing. Well, when David ends up becoming king once again and is restored back to his proper place, Shimei sees that he's got a problem on his hands. And so in verse 16 of chapter 19 of 2 Samuel, it says, Then Shimei the son of Gera the Benjamite, who was from Behurim, hurried and came down with the men of Judah to meet King David. There were a thousand men of Benjamin with him, with Ziba the servant of the house of Saul and his fifteen sons and his twenty servants with him. And they rushed to the Jordan before the king. Then they kept crossing the ford to bring over the king's household and to do what was good in his sight. And Shimei the son of Gera fell down before the king as he was about to cross the Jordan. So he said to the king, let not my Lord consider me guilty, nor remember what your servant did wrong on the day when my Lord the King came out from Jerusalem, so that the King would take it to heart. For your servant knows that I have sinned. Therefore, behold, I have come today, the first of all the house of Joseph, to go down to meet my Lord the King. But Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, said, Should not Shimei be put to death for this, because he cursed the Lord's anointed? David then said, What have I to do with you, O sons of Zoria, that you should this day be an adversary to, adversary to me? Should any man be put to death in Israel today? For do I not know that I am king over Israel today? The king said to Shimei, You shall not die. Thus the king swore to him. So in my estimation, the, the text does not say this, but... I tend to think that Shimei is kind of just covering his hide. Um, he may be genuinely sorry, but the text does not say one way or another. He does apologize to David and ask for forgiveness. And David is willing to grant it. He's not going to put him to death for what Shimei had done. And that is the, what, the rest of what we see of Shimei for a while. But I want to talk about one more person. And that is a man by the name of Barzillai. As David is fleeing from Absalom in chapter 17, it says in verse 27, Now when David had come to Mahananim, uh, excuse me, Shobi the son of Nahash from Rabbah the sons of Ammon, Maker the son of Amiel from Lodabar, and Barzillai the Gileadite from Rohelim, brought beds, basins, pottery, wheat, barley, flour, parched grain, beans, lentils, parched seeds, honey, curds, sheep, and cheese of the herd. 
for David and the people who were with him to eat. For they said, the people are hungry and weary and thirsty in the wilderness. And so Barzillai is among a number of men who, as David is at his lowest moment, is helping him. They bring him, he brings him food for him and his men so that they can rest from, from their, their weariness from fleeing in this instance. And so Barzillai had shown David kindness. And when David is restored, he does show kindness to Barzillai then. But I want to fast forward all of this to 1 Kings chapter 2. 1 Kings chapter 2, as David is on his deathbed, he talks to his rightful heir, Solomon. The insurrection of Adonijah had been put down. And Solomon had been anointed king. And so David is making charges to Solomon at this time in 1 Kings chapter 2 and verse 1. As David's time to die drew near, he charged Solomon his son, saying, I am going the way of all the earth. Be strong, therefore, and show yourself a man. Keep the charge of the Lord your God to walk in his ways, to keep his statutes, his commandments, his ordinances, and his testimonies according to what is written in the law of Moses, that you may succeed in all that you do and wherever you turn, so that the Lord may carry out his promise which he spoke concerning me, saying, If your sons are careful of their way to walk before me in truth with all their heart and with all their soul, you shall not lack a man on the throne of Israel. I do want to stop there for just a moment and make this point. But David has his priorities straight. The first thing that he tells Solomon is that Solomon needs to continue to walk in the way of the commandments of the Lord. And that if he would do that, God would bless him. God would continue to preserve his kingship in the line of David. And so David has that as his first priority. But now that he said that to Solomon, you keep the law of Moses, you walk in the ways of the commandments, David does have some unfinished business. In verse 5, David says, Now you also know what Joab the son of Zeruiah had done to me. What he did to the two commanders of the armies of Israel, to Abner the son of Ner, and to Amasa the son of Jether, whom he killed. He also shed the blood of war in peace. And he put about the blood of war on his belt, about his waist, and on his sandals on his feet. So act according to your wisdom, and do not let his gray hair go down to Sheol in peace. But show kindness to the sons of Basilai, the Gileadite, and let them be among those who eat at your table, for they assisted me when I fled from Absalom your brother. Behold, there is with you Shimei, the son of Ger, the Benjamite of the Horam, now it was he who cursed me with a violent curse on the day that I went to Mahanaim. But when he came down to me at the Jordan, I swore to him by the Lord, saying, I will not put you to death with the sword. Now therefore do not let him go unpunished, for you are a wise man, and you will know what you ought to do to him. You will bring his great hair down to Sheol with blood. And so David has some accounts to settle here. He, perhaps because of nepotism, perhaps because of his usefulness, it doesn't really say why he had let Joab go on unchecked for so long. But he says to Solomon, you know what the, Joab has done. You know that he has mur murdered two men, that he shed blood in the time of peace. <clears throat> He's a wicked man, and you're a wise man. You know what to do with him. The implication there is to put him to death for what he has done. And then he mentions Barzillai the Gileadite. And Barzillai was quite an old man, but he says, show kindness to his sons as well. Let them eat at your table, which was quite an honor to eat at the king's table because of the kindness that he showed. And then he talks about Shimei, the one who had cursed him. And he said, I swore that I would not kill him, but 
What he did does not need to go unpunished. He did throw violent curses at the Lord's anointed and he said, Solomon, you're a wise man. You know what to do. And so the first order of business in Solomon's kingship is he goes and he settles those accounts that David tells him to settle. It actually starts with Adonijah, the one who, his brother who had started a rebellion. Adonijah asked for the king's concubine, and Solomon sees this as an open act of rebellion, which I, I believe it is. And so Adonijah is put to death. And then Joab hears about Adonijah, and he knows that he's next. And so he goes and he flees to the tabernacle, and he's beside the altar. He's seeking refuge. But Solomon commands Benaiah to go and kill him, and so he does. And Shimei, Solomon says to him, Look, you know what you did to my father, but if you will stay in Jerusalem, if you cross over the brook Kidron, no, surely you will die. He gives him an ultimatum. He says, you're to stay here, but if you cross over the brook Kidron, know that you're going to be punished. Well, for a time, Shimei keeps this, but eventually he does cross over the brook Kidron and Solomon puts him to death. So where am I going with all of this? As much to me, this is interesting history that I've gone through. Maybe you don't find it as interesting but I didn't just bring this out to you because I found it interesting. I brought it out because I think there's something that we can learn from this. The last person that I want to talk to you about as far as settling accounts is the Lord. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 25. I'm speaking to people who I feel are educated in the scriptures. And so I feel confident to say to you that you know that there is a judgment coming. That the Lord will come back one day and judge every single person. And talking about this judgment in Matthew chapter 25, Jesus says, be on the alert then. This is verse 13 of chapter 25, Matthew 25, verse 13, Be on the alert then, for you do not know the day nor the hour. For it is just like a man about to go on a journey, who called his own slaves and entrusted his possessions to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, each according to his own ability, and he went on his journey. Immediately, the one who had received five talents went and traded with them and gave five more talents, gained five more talents. In the same manner, the one who had received the two talents gained two more. But he who received the one talent went away and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. Now after a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. I'll stop there. In talking about the judgment, Jesus compares it to a settling of accounts. In this parable, the talents, the, the men who were given talents, one was given five, one was given two, one was given one. And the master went on this journey expecting for his slaves to be good stewards of his possessions and gain for him more money as he's gone. But after a long time, he comes back and he settles the accounts. And if we were to continue on reading in the story, we'd see that he was pleased with the, the ones who had gained. The, the five-talent man gained five more. The two-talent man gained two more. But he was displeased with the one who just went and buried his talent. Didn't even put it in the bank for interest. And he called them a wicked and a lazy servant. <clears throat> And he rewarded 
the two that he was pleased with, and he punished the one that he was displeased with. He settled his accounts on that day. Turn to, with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. What we should understand about the judgment is that we will be recompensed according to what we have done. Paul says this in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10. He says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. <clears throat> That term recompensed is uh, an accounting term. It means paid back. You might see the word a compensation found in that word recompense. Same, same root, if I understand correctly. Well, we, we talk about this when we, we go to work and we receive our, our wages. You might call it compensation. You are compensated for the work that you do. In the judgment, when we all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, we are recompensed for our deeds done in the body according to what we have done, whether good or bad. We are going to be paid back for those things that we have done. And the question is, Will you pay the penalty for doing evil? Or will you receive a reward? Paul talks about this in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 6. Paul says, For after all, it is only just for God to repay with affliction those who afflict you and to give relief to you who are afflicted and to us as well, when the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with His mighty angels in flaming fire, dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. These will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power when He comes to be glorified in His saints on that day and to be marveled at among all who have believed for our testimony to you was believed. Paul talks about when Jesus Christ comes back, that final day, the day of judgment, there are going to be two camps. Those who are disbelievers, who do not know God, those who do not obey the gospel of Jesus Christ, those people are going to pay the penalty of eternal destruction. If you want to think about this in an accounting term, when Jesus comes back, He's going to find their account in debt. He's going to find them lacking. And so they will have to find to pay the penalty of eternal destruction. But to those who obey the gospel of Jesus Christ, to those who are faithful to him, even in spite of affliction, in spite of persecution, those people are going to be glo to glorify Jesus. That's what it says in verse 10. They will uh, when he comes to be glorified in His saints on that day and to be marveled at among all those who have believed. Jesus is going to be glorified by His saints and other passages talk about the reward that they will receive, that is eternal life. And so, when God comes back, when Jesus comes back to settle all of the accounts, What is your account going to show? And I wanted to bring this back to Jacob and David. Because I think that some people think that God is just letting things go. 
letting things slide. That seemed to be the case with Jacob, right? He rebukes Simeon and Levi, but kind of leaves it there. He hears of what Reuben did, but just kind of leaves it there. No, Jacob remembered. And when it came time to settle those accounts, he settled them. Think about all the times that Joab seemed to just get away with literally murder. But David remembered. David settled his account with his son Solomon. And I'm not claiming a perfect parallel between those things and the judgment day because I think those men were flawed and, and sometimes didn't do what they needed to do as far as settling accounts in some situations. But the parallel is this. Some people think that God is just letting things slide. Some people think that God is just going to let wickedness continue on forever and ever. Turn with me to 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3. And starting in verse 3. 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 3. Know this first of all, that in the last days mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of His coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. For when they maintain this, it escapes their notice that by the word of God, the heavens existed long ago and that the earth was formed out of water and by water, through which the world at that time was destroyed, being flooded with water. But by His word, the present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. But do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years and a thousand years like one day. The Lord is not slow about His promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, and not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, in which the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat, and the earth and its works will be burned up. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? looking for and hastening the coming of the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning and the elements will melt with intense heat. Some people say God's never coming. God's never going to do anything about the wickedness in this world. And Peter says it escapes their notice that he already has in times past, such as when he flooded the entire earth and destroyed it. And they fail to realize that what they say is slowness is actually God's patience. God is being patient. Not willing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. And he says, you know that it's going to happen. That the earth is going to be destroyed. The earth and its works will be bur burned up. And since all these things are going to be destroyed this way, what sort of people ought you to be? As the Lord comes back and He settles the accounts of all mankind, where do we want to be with all that? What sort of people ought we to be now knowing that the Lord is going to pay back every single person for what they have done? As we're about to sing the invitation song in just a moment, I want you to be thinking about that, that thought. Think about where you stand with the Lord at this present time. If the Lord were to come back right now, where does your account stand with the Lord? If you find yourself lacking 
don't let this opportunity go to waste. If you have not obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ, know that you will pay the penalty of eternal destruction if the Lord comes back. But that doesn't have to be the case. You can obey the, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ this morning. Believing in Jesus Christ as the Son of God. Confessing His name before men. Repenting of your sins. And being baptized for the remission of your sins. If you are a Christian and perhaps you have not been living the way that you ought. Know that this is a time for you to make things right. If you have any need, won't you come while we stand and sing?